There's been no baby ever like him. Announced by angels, born of a virgin, living a life of miracles, dying and rising again for our sins, ascending into heaven, as we mentioned a moment ago, coming back again, and perhaps today. No other life like that life, completely unique. As we look at our key text, and we'll be looking at other scriptures, and Micah 5.2 that has been read, let's read it again and refresh ourselves. Micah 5.2 says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, through you, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. From everlasting there literally means from the days of eternity this little one came from. The fact that not only Christ pre-existed before he was born, but even more than that, Christ existed eternally eternally, which is an amazing statement. But as we look at this wonderful prophecy of the coming Mashiach, and he is the Hamelech, the king Mashiach, because there are many messiahs, so to speak, when kings were anointed, they were really called messiah too, because anointing refers to that. But they were not the messiah, the king messiah. This is the one that Orthodox Jews are looking for today. But he came already. And he's coming back again. And we know him. And this Messiah was born in that little dusty town called Bethlehem. Interestingly enough, house of bread for one who said, I am the bread of life. And he was born in one particular Bethlehem of Ephratah, a district distinguishing it from the other Bethlehem. And he's described just not as a baby born, but one who existed from eternity. Wow, let's take a look at that, because it has such great relevance for us today. As we think of the bread of life that he called himself, being born in the house of bread, Bethlehem, Let's think about the food of Bethlehem. In Bethlehem that day was born spiritual food, our food. I think it's a true statement for most of us, we all like to eat. And I can personally testify that I do, and I have the evidence to prove it. One of the things I really enjoy are different kinds of bread, I'm sure you do too. But, you know, we can use bread in another way. Even though Jesus said he was the bread of life, the bread that offers life, there is that bread of deceit. There is that false bread out there that we really need to be careful because the true light came into the world. That Bethlehem morning, that Christmas morning, the true light came into the world. There's the bread of different philosophies. The bread that they want us to eat. But the bread that they offer, the bread that the world offers, the food that the world offers, doesn't really satisfy. It's a bread that leaves us empty and hopeless in the end. Even though they claim it's good for us, it'll give us joy and happiness is really bread of deceit. You know, when Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, he wrote these words about such bread. In Colossians 2.8, he says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through the philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Dear friends, Beware of the bread of the world. 
that looks good and seems to taste good for the moment, but leaves you empty and hopeless in the end. It'll plunder you and take you captive. Paul writes to Timothy about something similar. In 1 Timothy 6, 20 through 21, he says, O oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to you. That is the truth of the gospel, the truth of the word of God. What was committed to your trust, avoiding profane and idle babblings, that is empty chatter. And then he goes on to say, and contradictions... And get this last phrase of what is falsely called knowledge. There's a lot out there in this world that the world offers, but it's not true knowledge. It's not the truth. It doesn't stand up against the word of God. It is falsely called knowledge. It's being taught to us and our children in the school system and in the universities. And they call that good bread? No, that's the bread of deceit. That's the bread of lies. That's the bread of false teaching. Dear friends, we need to be aware of that. There is much out there that is falsely called knowledge. And we need to stay close to the word of God to be able to see this. You see, their bread doesn't satisfy. They are full of empty deceit. Teaching the teachings of men and not of God. Remember, Jesus often brought the Pharisees back to the word of God, right? What saith the scripture? What does the scripture say? You err because you know not the scripture. The teachings of men they were following. So in the secular world, and the liberal religious world out there, beware of the false teaching, the bread of deceit, Looks good, tastes good for the moment, but leaves you high and dry, leaves you empty, and is definitely not according to Christ. They leave the Christ of the Bible out. And I want to qualify that. When I say the Christ of the Bible, they may include Christ here and there in what they talk about, but not the Christ of the Bible, an entirely different Christ. Now, the truth that Christ offers will satisfy. He says, learn of me. Learn of me. He gives us the word of truth. We're told taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, Jeremiah knew that. I love his statement, Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. That's true bread. His word was the living word, the true food, the bread that really satisfied. I love it when Isaiah talks about it in Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to me. And you who have no money, come and buy bread. Now this is good bread. Yes, come and buy wine and milk without money, without price. The wine and milk stand is symbols of abundance and richness. But it's free. The gift of eternal life is free. And then he asks the Pearson question, why do you spend money for that which is not bread? Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? Dear friends, many Christians out there are being deceived and they're taking from the bread of this world. They're spending money and time and effort on it. And that's really not bread. And why your wages for that which does not satisfy? Carefully listen to me and eat what is good. You see, the bread of life was born in the house of bread, Bethlehem, that morning. Only that bread will satisfy. Only that bread will make the difference in our life. Jesus said in 635, He who comes to me shall never hunger. We need to look for no one else but that bread. I want to ask you, are you feeding upon that bread daily? Do you have fellowship with him? Do you spend time in the living word of God? That bread of life came down that we might eat it 
that we might enjoy it, that it might be a part of our life every day, that we might be satisfied with that and not the deceitful philosophies and bread of this world. So that made a difference. When that bread of life came down in Bethlehem, it separated truth from error, light from darkness, hope from hopelessness. Dear friend, you and I need to visit that bread of life every day. We met him when we first trusted him, but are we feeding upon him daily? Yesterday's food won't do. We need to be fed daily. So we think then of this little babe in Bethlehem as the bread of life born in the house of bread, but also I think of Jesus too, now that I've looked at it, as the well of Bethlehem. Remember those hot summer days, not too far away, when your tongue seemed to be hanging out? Maybe there was a special day when you remembered you were so thirsty and you would have given all the money in your pocket for some cold water. You just didn't have it available. You were desperate for a glass of water. And remember how refreshed you felt when you finally got a hold of it. Man, you just, you had to do it slowly because you were afraid you might just swallow it down too fast. It was so good. You felt so refreshed. I want you to turn to 2 Samuel 23 for a moment. And someone else felt that way too. And as we, if we look at this, we see David engaged in warfare uh, with the Philistines. And starting at, you know, verse 13, it says, Then there were three of thirty chief men who went down at harvest time and came to David. He was in the cave of Adullam. Uh, Bethlehem is like up here. Adullam is like over here, uh, probably about nine miles away. And they were in war with the Philistines. And David just had this hankering for some of his hometown water, Bethlehem, where he was born. And David was there in the stronghold garrison. And he had that thirst we were talking about. And David said, with longing, oh, verse 15, oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water from the well of Bethlehem by the gate, and they took it and they brought it back to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the men who were in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, I will not drink it. He realized that these men sacrifice their life, put their lives on risk to get him some water. And he just felt he couldn't drink it after that. Wow, what an amazing story. The well of Bethlehem in enemy territory. Indeed, three men broke through the Philistine lines to get him that drink at the risk of putting their own lives, their own blood at risk. But you know, as I think about it, Jesus really is the well of Bethlehem. Is he not? Jesus was referring to a well one day, talking to a Samaritan woman. He said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain, a well, a spring, leaping up into everlasting life. You see, Jesus is the real well that satisfies our thirst. He is the real bread, the real food that satisfies our hunger. Now, the woman was so amazed at this because every day she would come and draw for water. You know, in the Middle East, the hot countries, you had to really drink lots of water every day. The woman said, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Boy, that would be a benefit, right? Boy, that would save a lot of time. If I could take a drink of this, one drink, and that would satisfy my thirst. 
In John 7, 37, he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Oh, I tell you, when I hear that, it gets me so excited. Rivers of living water. He is the well. That child born in Bethlehem really is the true well of Bethlehem. You see, he shed his blood that he might bring us this water of life. He not only took the risk, but more than that, he laid down his life so that you and I could drink of this well and be saved. Now you went to that well the first day you trusted Christ. You went to that well when you said, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Save me. I'm depending upon you and you only to save me. But you know what? It doesn't stop there. You and I need to keep going daily to that well and drinking to be strengthened and refreshed. Boy, in this world in which we live today, the horrific things that we hear about day by day, we can be easily influenced by that. Our joy could be taken away, be full of fear and anxiety. But no, this is not how we should be. The birth of Jesus is that well, that fountain of life, that new creation, that refreshment, that renewal, that restoration, that vitality, that vitalness and freshness that he wants us to experience, not just when we came to him, but on a daily basis. How many Christians can testify? You know, when they came to Christ, oh, that was so exciting. I remember when I came to Christ, I was so excited. I was full of joy. I mean, I was just bubbling all over. Then a short time later, they seem to have lost that, that refreshment, that joy, that vitality. And I want to ask you, have you lost that freshness that refreshment? Are you lacking that vitalness that you once had? That vitality? Are you? Is your joy present? Or have you been so often joyless in your Christian life? I think that you and I have to make a regular habit of visiting that Bethlehem well, which is Jesus, and drinking deeply every day and be refreshed and rejuvenated. If anyone thirst, let him come <clears throat> to me. Dear friends, we need that for our lives. We need to be fresh and green and alive and full of vitality. You say, boy, how can you in a world like today? We can by our union with Jesus Christ and our walk with him. He promises that true life. So indeed, Jesus is that well of Bethlehem. I'm sure David must have drank from that well growing up as a boy, shepherd boy, many, many times, and he remembered it. It was still there, how wonderful it was. But you see, he had to keep going back. It didn't satisfy. But when you and I are born again, we take, take of that one drink that saves us. But now that we're saved, to be daily refreshed in our walk with him. But, you know, looking at our text, our Micah 5-2 text, we learn something else. That day, not only was our real food born and our well, the well of Bethlehem, uh, born there that day, but there was a ruler born that day. There was a ruler. Out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be born a ruler in Israel. Wow, how exciting. I want to ask you a question. Who rules you? Who rules you? Is it your feelings? Do they rule you? Your moods? Your passions? Your desires? Maybe it's your pleasures. All those are the wrong rulers. They don't measure up. Indeed, only Christ can be the ruler. That baby born in Bethlehem was to be ruler in Israel. As a matter of fact, when he was born, and news about his birth happened, uh, let's turn to Matthew 2, and we see the reaction there. Because Herod was ruling at that time. 
He was a vicious and wicked man, even killing family members and always guarding his throne. Horrific. We read now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And everyone went, yay, wonderful. Let's go find him. Oh, this is such good news. We've been waiting for this. No, we don't read that strangely. But when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the child was to be born. So they said to him, you know, taking out the scroll of the Hebrew scriptures and reading, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not among, at least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Same scripture we're referring to in Micah 5 too, right? Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I too may also come and kill him, not worship him. That's the real intent, indeed. You see, when this king was born, when this ruler was born, it shook up the governing powers at the time. The idea of losing their authority and losing their power really concerned them. You see, dear friend, and every time you and I live for Christ and let his light shine and spread the gospel, the darkness in this world and the rulers of darkness in this world, those who follow him, they are shook up because they are afraid of being dethroned as well and losing their power. The gospel is a threat to the enslavement and darkness of this world and those rulers who follow that and would impose it upon us. While they felt that and their control was threatened, we know that because Herod took the lives of all these little babies, two years old and under, to make sure that this little king would never survive and grow up. But you know it was futile? It was futile on his part because that babe he tried to destroy who would be ruler in Israel would not only rule Israel, but one day he would rule all the nations of the world. <laughs> what a thought that is. All the nations on earth. It tells us in the scriptures in Philippians 2, one day every knee will bow of those in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Boy, I'll tell you, that makes the darkness tremble. That makes the Christ haters go nuts because one day they're going to have to acknowledge him. They're going to have to acknowledge him. But you know what? That day when he rules the nations, Psalm 2 talks about that. It's wonderful. Isaiah 2 talks about that. Micah talks about that. We don't have to wait for that, for him to rule our lives. He wants to rule our lives today. That baby born in Bethlehem wants to be, indeed, now grown, wants to be ruler of our lives. He wants to take charge of our lives. But we have to give him control. We have to give him control. And I've shared this illustration before, but many have liked it. Let me share it again. There's this fellow hitchhiking down the road. Excuse me. Jesus hitchhiking down the road. Quite a fellow indeed. Someone says, oops, stops the car. Jesus, whoa. He says, come on in, Jesus. Hop in the back seat. Jesus says, no. Smiles at him. He said, well, come on, sit on the passenger side. And Jesus smiles lovingly. He says, no. He said, well, I don't understand what you want. He said, push over. From now on, I'm doing the driving. Mm -hmm. He wants complete control of the wheel. And you know, we have trouble with that in our lives. That's a struggle in our Christian life. The fact is we want to do some controlling. 
we want to have our hands still on the wheel. And maybe there are some areas of your life this morning that you want to be in charge of. And maybe these areas in your life this morning are sapping your joy, your peace, your victory in Christ. We know in our heart that he wants us to surrender these things to him, but yet we still cling to them. We still hold on to them. This babe born in Bethlehem who came to live and die and redeem us is coming again. And it could be, as we've said a moment ago, this very day. The question is now, have we been living for him? Have we been willing to give him charge in our life? Can you say today that he is ruling in your life? That he's really in charge? That your life is characterized by a life of obedience? I have to ask myself that question. Is my life characterized by a life of obedience to him? If not, why not even begin today to come to Christ and say, Lord, you know, you've come as a ruler. One who will rule not only Israel, but the world one day. And you're coming back today, and you want to rule in my life. You want to be in charge, but I've been fighting for that. To keep my territory, my interests, my things. I've held on to that wheel, and I didn't want to completely give it over to you. Maybe today, wouldn't it be great, the greatest gift you could give Christ this Christmas is complete surrender, total control, to say, Lord, I give myself to you. I'm going to stop fighting. All these areas of my life that I've reserved kind of for me, and I've just let you in in certain rooms, but not all of the rooms of my life, I give you all the rooms, the closets, the attics, and the basements of my life, holding nothing back. Will you let him rule today? So when I think of that incredible baby born in Bethlehem, I think of the real ruler of my life. You know, Jeremiah said it well, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. Why do we, even as Christians, so many times try to direct our own steps when we know our way is really not in ourselves? but it's in him. And then finally, looking at this text, I look at, well, God incarnate in Bethlehem. Yes, because this child born is described in the most amazing terms, whose goings forth are from of old, ancient times, from everlasting, from the days of eternity, you might say a first-in-time event took place in the world. We could say even the history of the world and the universe when God's Son was born into this world. I like to say God the Son. It's more specific. You, you could put it this way. In that Bethlehem moment, the eternal God was incarnated in human flesh for time and for eternity. Think about that. The eternal God was incarnated in human flesh for all time and eternity. This baby, this ruler spoken of as in an incredible way whose goings forth are from days of eternity from everlasting called Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 7, 14. Now took on a human body. This was no ordinary baby. Not only did he pre-exist, but he existed eternally, as we've said. Remember when he was speaking to those who wanted to kill him, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Linking himself with Exodus 3, 14, the God who said his name is I am, the eternal God, 
And then they went to stone him as a result, realizing that he was claiming to be Yahweh, Jehovah God. God incarnate in Bethlehem. Incredible. The Nicene Creed says it this way. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things, visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of the same substance with the Father by whom all things were made. Oof, heavy stuff. But boy, it says it well. This God was born sinless in human flesh, and he lived and he walked among his creation. Do we take that to heart? Do we really realize that this baby was God incarnate in human flesh? You know, sometimes you wonder about Mary. How much did she know? How much did she really know about this child? I think it slowly was unfolding to her the full realization of who he really was. We can see this when he was 12, you know, in the temple when they went searching after him. We can see this when the shepherds announced what they had seen, uh, and, and they, they explained how the angels uh, gave a message and said who this child was. And it says Mary pondered all these things in her heart, uh, just slowly unfolding. How much did Mary know? A little song came out years ago, expresses this very well. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would someday walk on water. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? The child that you've delivered will soon deliver you? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm a storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? And when you kissed your little baby, you kissed the face of God. Mary, did you know the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again, the lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the Lamb? Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb. This sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. What a thought. It says it so well. I want to ask you today, as we consider this incredible Bethlehem baby, have you been to that well? Are you drinking daily? Do you know him? Do you have the joy and refreshment and vitalness of a relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you letting the ruler from Bethlehem rule in your hearts daily? Have you made him the Lord of your life? Have you surrendered to him fully? Are you feeding on that bread of life daily and tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. And finally, are you taking to heart that the babe of Bethlehem is the eternal God is existing from everlasting times? This is the great I am. Do you worship him daily in your heart? 
Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. As we consider Christ born in Bethlehem, who he really is, and what he should mean to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.